Once again, the launching phase takes us from the end of the loading phase to the contact point with the ball, and it consists of five noticeable movements. And in this video, we're going to talk about the fifth and last movement, which is the guiding action of the hands on the bat, and identify the muscles involved with this motion. The bat head is the recipient of all the centrifugal force created in the body due to the rotation of the hips and spine, along with the pushing and pulling action of the shoulders and arms. This is first made possible by seven muscles in each hand and three muscles in each forearm, holding the bat handle with a firm grip. The hand grip muscles located in the hands are the flexor digiti minimi brevis, opponent's digiti minimi, opponent's pollicis, flexor pollicis brevis, adductor pollicis, palmar interossei, and first dorsal interossei. And the hand grip muscles located in the forearms are the flexor pollicis longus, flexor digitorum superficialis, and the flexor digitorum profundus. Now, aside from holding the bat handle with a firm grip, the hand's other job is to supply direction to the bat from the initiation of the swing to the contact point with the ball. And this starts with the hands first directing the knob end of the bat inside the flight of the pitch towards the center of the ball, as seen in this image. With all the explosive rotational movement taking place in the body, the bat head is soon found lagging behind the hands, as seen in this image. The rotation of the body and the action of the shoulders and arms will help bring the bat head around toward the contact point with the ball. However, any movement in the wrists that was done prior to this point during the loading phase such as that which would have taken place during the cocking of the wrists, will have to be restored or returned to a more neutral position at contact. This is because the best position for the wrists and hands to be in to transfer all of this explosive rotational power into the bat is square or neutral with respect to the forearms. This means the wrists are in a position without any flexion, extension, radial deviation, or alter deviation, or any combination of these. Hand and wrist joints are at their strongest in this neutral position, which is necessary to power the bat head through the ball without being deflected. If the bat head is deflected in any way when making contact with the ball due to a weak grip, loss of power will result. So this is why it's important to make contact with a ball with the hands and wrists in a neutral or square position. Now, as a side note here, if you look closely at this image, you will notice that the player's left forearm is in a pronated position and the right forearm is in a supinated position. But neither of these forearm positions affects the wrist joint. If you recall from video number six of this series in the cocking of the wrists, we saw that pronation of the forearm occurs at the elbow joint and not the wrist joint. And while we didn't mention it there, supination of the forearm also takes place at the elbow joint and not at the wrist joint. So again, what is taking place in the elbow joints at contact does not affect the position of the wrist joints. So to finish up here, the ideal contact point is where the bat head meets the ball at 90 degrees from the direction of the pitch, with the wrists in a neutral or square position. However, a margin of 15 degrees in either direction will still enable you to hit the ball with tremendous power. Thanks for watching the video, and if you'd like to, please leave a comment or suggestion regarding this segment of the anatomy of the baseball swing.